How do stories shape who we become? Can stories change a person's destiny or do they amplify what's already there? On today's episode of the Live a Meaningful Story podcast, we'll continue our conversation on Dune by focusing on the newly released part two. This masterclass in science fiction filmmaking further explores the power of a story and a dream once it takes root in people. I love storytelling. It's my passion and what I've built my company, All Things Narrative, on. But what are the potential dangers in storytelling? The stories we tell ourselves and others have power even if we don't fully recognize their implications. And the one who controls the narrative can shape reality to however they see fit. Never before have I experienced a film that so wrestles with the beauties and the horrors of storytelling. And if you are ready to thoughtfully engage the themes in this cautionary tale, then get ready for a deep dive into Dune Part 2. Welcome to the Live a Meaningful Story podcast, where we learn how to navigate life one film at a time. We are four friends with backgrounds in storytelling, filmmaking, teaching, and narrative therapy. Join us on our quest towards telling and living our stories more meaningfully. I'm Derek Hatch. My name is Nick Natal. Hello, hello, everybody. I'm Joseph Wilson. I'm Jason Lin. Yeah, this movie's epic, y'all. So if you have not seen this, we are going to spoil it. So go, go to the theater. It is a great theatrical experience. Go see it. Please support the official release. Yes, yes. In IMAX. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we really vote with our wallets, right? <laughs> yeah. And so yes. you do. So if you want more movies like this, then go see blue movies like this. Yeah. And don't complain if you get crap from Hollywood when you pay to go see Madam Web or whatever garbage is out there right now. <laughs> Someone asked me if they should go see Madam Web. I said, do not waste your money. Do not waste your do not waste Web. your breath. <laughs> Just seeing every movie. I want to start with this quote. I read this quote a lot to clients. I read this even in just consultations and in just conversation. It's again, this comes from the storytelling animal. We introduced this in part one. If you haven't heard part one, highly recommend going back. But this comes from Jonathan Gottschall's book here. And it says, story, whether delivered through films, books, or video games, teaches us facts about the world, influences our moral logic, and marks us with fears, hopes, and anxieties that alter our behavior, perhaps even our personalities. Research shows that story is constantly nibbling and needing us, shaping our minds without our knowledge or consent. The more deeply we are cast under story's spell, the more potent its influence. That, to me, in a lot of ways, is Dune Part 2. You sound no gaib. Not just within the narrative, but even how I felt. So when I saw this movie, I went with Tori on opening day. And when I got done, I went to the bathroom because I had to go to the bathroom like half the movie and I was just holding it. I couldn't get up. (laughs) So I went to the bathroom and you know, like the feeling like when you've held it in for a long time and Mm -hmm. you just go and it's just that sense of relief. As I was standing over the urinal... I was overwhelmed with emotion and I just started crying. You know what's funny? <laughs> Nick, I, want Nick, to, I, I want to hear. I want this to be unbroken. I go want ahead. To hear. Go ahead. I stood over the urinal having the most relieving piss of my life with tears because I this movie made me feel so many things especially as someone who loves storytelling. Cause there is like the craft of storytelling is done so well here, but also there's this line in the movie that says you will see the beauty and the horror. That's how I felt this whole movie, the beauty and the horror of storytelling. And that's what Gotchel is getting at here is when a people are cast under a story spell, he says later in the book, that story makes us one, right? It unites us it, it, as a people, but it also at the same time can cast us under a spell to where we are just going with the story yeah, and it has this power over us. And that is what Paul Atreides is doing here is is he has taken control of the narrative of an entire people. It reminds me of autopilot with Wally and stuff like that. The Mm. Freemen are starting to go on autopilot and just blindly following. Yes. Just Messiah figure. Again, that has been planted long, long. Right. Before. Well, it's this religious impulse. Yeah. I think one of the things Frank Herbert's saying in his book, and I think Denis Villeneuve is echoing here, is that you can't kill the religious impulse in man. 
even in the year 10,000, you know, where we're so advanced as a civilization and we're doing space travel, there is still this deep fundamental desire for reverence, for transcendence, what, for something divine, for meaning. For meaning. meaning. Yes. Yeah, the mind has to find meaning. It has to find it. And so. Paul Atreides, I think <clears throat> slowly throughout part one and now into part two, he recognizes this and he recognizes this is who I need to become in order to save these people and to take control of the universe. Mm -hmm. Is Which he is trying to wild. Save, is I was about to ask that them? too. I was about to ask that too. Is he really trying to save them though? That's he the is. question, yeah. right? That's the tension I there. Think he is. Like, I think it kind of starts to shift more towards revenge mm -hmm. towards the end. But, but I even genuinely brought, believe that he is for those people. But you've even brought up the point that in the beginning he was talking about like when his mother said that right. you're not your father wasn't about revenge or something like that. He's like, but I do. Yeah, but, and I am, yeah. But it's yeah. so is it is it really a caring about it? Because it's more like I'm I'm here to Yeah, I would say it is a I don't this, know. In the like, moment is, he's getting both. Is, like he cares is, about them, but yeah. he's also like and that could be up to speculation. He yeah. says if I die, I die. Or is he is putting his life on the line, but he is also getting his revenge. Is it more self-preservation though? Because I do just, think that's part of it. Yeah, yeah, it's more like he's 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 here, this, so it might as well learn the ways of people. Yeah, I kind of like these people, but I, it's like this, riding a sandworm isn't necessarily self-preservation. He but, didn't have to learn to do that. But it's probably. But he's also hearing he did, these. Though. Yeah, yeah, he yeah, did. I guess you're right. But it's also this, he's learning these prophecies and things like that behind the scenes as yeah. well. So it's like, well. I, he probably couldn't ignore, like think of the fact like a giant worm is going to come. Right. But still him stepping into that. This is my theory. Paul Atreides was always told all his life, like every millennial it was, that you are destined for greatness. You are special and awesome just the way. And I think that there was, whether it was his mother or his father, you are meant to rule. You are meant to have this power now, when that story is taken away from him by the assault of the Harkonnens on the Atreides people in the first film, Paul finds a way to keep that story alive. Yeah. And I do think it is self-preservation. I do think there is his father's compassion in there, right, for the Fremen. But I do think that Paul is ultimately making sure that he still is who he's been told that he's going to be. And that's, that's I think, the question that's really is wrestling with here, right, is in regards to identity. Because there's two schools of thought with identity. Some say that you're born with kind of like a fixed identity. This is who you are. And there's certain stories that play into that. There's also the idea, and this is more of like the narrative practice idea, is that identity is dynamic. It is something that, you are growing in, in some sense, and it's not necessarily fixed. There are a lot of things with it that could change. There might be a core identity, right? But yeah. at the same time, identity is something that can be reauthored. Re it's not steady. It's something in dynamic negotiation with those around you. And so that's a, a lot of the tension with, with identity there. And when I work with my clients, I definitely lean more towards this narrative practice idea of identity, right? that it is dynamic, that it is in negotiation with those around you. So it sounds like you lean towards the Bene Gesserit idea <laughs> of identity. No, and I actually think the Bene Gesserit is the opposite idea. No, well, because Paul, it seems like his tension with identity is the fixed identity of, you know, House of Trades and mm -hmm. then the, the, the more fluid, the fluid identity well, well, of the Bene Gesserit. Well, I actually think the Bene Gesserit is trying to tell Paul that this is your true identity, mm. right? I actually think they both groups, I think, have the same idea of identity, but they just don't agree with what Paul's identity is. I think Frank Herbert and Denis Villeneuve actually have the other view of identity yeah, and, because I think that's the story they're trying to tell. And Duke Leto, too, is actually giving them a choice. Yes, so, yes, yeah. Because yeah. who is the real Paul? We've had probably like a thousand texts between us this I week key. to oh, try to get to the heart I of this movie, right? I was at work, right? at the end of work, there was like a hundred and something. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I was like, well, <laughs> this is the big realization I had, right? And I think a lot of this, I give hats off to Timothy Chamolet's performance because most actors have to, they get an archetype and they stick within the archetype and that's their 
role. But as I've realized, I think this is a dynamic flowing between archetypes, and that's what makes this performance so good. So Paul Atreides is the son of Leto. He's compassionate but strong. He is a combination of the warrior and the caregiver put together, which as we know from the archetypes, right, Nick, that those two are meant to be in balance with each other, and Leto is the balance, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's why he is the aspirational figure. So that is who Paul is as Paul Atreides. Then there's the name that he's given, Usul, which means strength at the base of the pillar. There's a scene where Stilgar says that you need like these names, right, to be Fremen. Yeah. So Usul is this name that Shani, the Zendaya's character, mm. that as they're forming a relationship, she wants to call him Usul. And I think this speaks to his lover archetype, right? That he is somebody who wants to give himself for her. She is ultimately like he has this vision of her and this nuclear kind of like apocalypse, right? That is what drives him in a lot of his decisions that he makes. That's the lover. You're willing to lay down your life, right? And I think Shawnee is the embodiment of that. When he's Usul, he is that lover. He is that strength at the base of the pillar. But then he's also takes this other name, which is Mwadib, and that's the small desert mouse. Now that this desert mouse in part one, we see in this awesome little thing that we think is just a throwaway shot at first, where the mouse is basically, you guys remember it? Where the mouse is drinking its own. Uh, yeah. Like sweat, sweat right? Mm. Happens on his ear and it trickles down and, his mouth. And so the mouse, the desert mouse could take what it's given and use it to stay alive. Self-preservation, right? And that's Muad'Dib. And that's also archetype wise, that's the seeker. The seeker is constantly looking for that which is going to aid them on the journey. That is Paul. He is the Muad'Dib. He is the, the seeker, the one who is using every situation to figure out. And this is the hero's journey stuff that comes in, right? But then he's also, mm -hmm. yeah, I know it keeps going. Then he's also the Mahdi. He's the one who will lead us to paradise. That word means deliverer, right? Mm. And again, this is the ruler archetype. And this is who he will become by the end of the film. But then he's also the Lisa and Al Gaib, right? He's the voice from the outer world. He's the revolutionary. He's the one who brings a change to the Fremen way of life. But he's also, yeah. you see where I'm going with yeah. this? He's also the Quitsats, how do you say it? The, Quizas Hadra. Thank you. Jason he's, with the name. I know, Jason bro. is our name there guy There is here. no reason Seriously. why you said that perfect, Jason. And, <laughs> and that identity, that's the male Bene Gesserit. And that's the magician. That's when he has the vision in part one. When he, when he has that vision of the Holy War, mm -hmm. the voice, that's what the voice is saying. And that's when he, with the spice, it awakens the magician archetype in him. He's also the Baron's um, grandson. Spoiler. Yes, exactly, yeah, right? Was crazy. Yeah. So, so he's Paul, Harkonnen and Atreides yeah. uh -huh. and Fremen. And yeah. Bene Gesserit. Yeah. He is the archetypes. He is a clash, a contradiction of archetypes. He is trying to be everything to everybody. And he is trying to live all possible stories yeah. at once. And so it's no wonder he is deemed as the Messiah because only Christ can do that. Mm. Only Christ can be the one to embody all the archetypes. And <laughs> you see where I'm going? It's, it's, a, it's amazing. Yeah. You see how what I'm feeling as I'm watching this I, movie? I hope, the view, I hope the listeners are feeling this. Yeah, it's insane. It's pretty dope. Yeah. yeah. This was my big moment. This was my big epiphany. This is what I was seeing. This is why I was so emotional as I was weeping in the bathroom after watching this. <laughs> I am like, this is a story about trying to be everything to every one. Yep. This is trying to live out all the stories and the fact that you you can't do that well. You're going to disappoint yeah, someone. You're, the, a lover is going to suffer for the ruler to take charge. Opposite right? of Christ. So like the yeah. difference between Christ, Christ can carry all this and, yes. still, and still do what he needs to do. Right. When we do this, this is what the story tells of what we do if we try to carry all this because exactly. it's ultimately not for us to just carry alone. No human being is meant to experience, right? Yeah. We, are, we all have a story. We can't live all the stories. We can't be all the archetypes. Yeah. We can't. It, the, the burden is too much to bear. Only Christ can do it. Yeah. So. That's crazy. That's cool. 
<laughs> I'm just shaking my head. <laughs> Wait, I do want to go back. Yeah, to yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Let's a, let, we can talk about anything to now. To a counter argument of um of Paul actually caring. So I <laughs> honestly believe that he went to what what's her name again? Chani. 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 Mm-hmm. Because she was the head of the people that were non the non believers. Well, because there's two groups, yeah, right? The she, fundamentalists she in the, the south and not. She can't she, 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 she's seen as like she's a, seen as the leader of them, even though still mm-hmm. well, still guards like a leader, right? Yeah. In an official sense of yeah. the south, but she's kind of yeah. has that respect. Because if he really cared in that sense, he wouldn't have tried to do anything. But he's out there boasting, like, well, you know, I'm. <laughs> of course, I'm not. But mm-hmm. if I were to be. You know, this person, this is what I would do. Like, he's not he's not being humble. Right. He's still out there trying to present his image. Well, he's trying to win. Way. He's trying to win over the people. Yeah. Right. He's, he's still well, manipulating. He's got an agenda. Yeah. yeah. Well, and Shani, an agenda. well, and Shani says to, to Paul, she says, you'll never lose me as long as you stay who you are. Mm-hmm. Right. But it's interesting you because- know, who, yeah, is, exactly. who is he? Who is he? And who is he to her? Because to her, she doesn't even want to call him by the other names. Mm-hmm. She says, you're just useful. You're just the lover to me. Yeah. Like, that's who you are, right? But that's, is that really who he Jason, is? What, J- go ahead, I think, Jason. Jason I think that's something. the identity he most forfeits by the end. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I 100% agree with that. I have a counter counterpoint. <laughs> <laughs> because there's a time where he's sitting by himself and he has the the signet ring of his father's mm. and he says, father, I found my way. And yeah. He takes it off and he puts it away. So it was like, Hey, I'm giving up on this Duke thing. Yeah. I'm giving up on leading. I want to be with a friend. in the beginning, it starts off with, I have to sway these people mm-hmm. so that they believe me. It's self-preservation. And then I can get at the emperor and get at this. And it starts with revenge. He starts to lose that a little bit as he goes with the Fremen. He does not want to go to the south at all. He does not want to be Quizas Hadarak. He doesn't want to take that on. And he, like when he when, knows when, that's what's gonna happen. Yeah, right? when the siege gets hit, he literally goes, I cannot go south. Like he does <laughs> he puts his hands together and goes <laughs> and like he says it in the language like, I cannot go south. Everyone else go. I'll hold them off. And stay by myself. You all go. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of giving up on all that. But mm-hmm. he has the visions. He Here's Jamis telling him that in order to see everything, yes. he has to take it. He, ha- oh, he has to you come have to, to the highest, ascend the highest yeah. dune. So you can see everything. The voices are telling him you have to see the past to see the future. It blows my mind that that line is not in the book. That is a Vilnuv really? line. That is a Vilnuv line. I and really I think that is guy. the best line of dialogue in part two. I was like, that's, okay. that's what you, Paul has to do. Yeah. Right? And he says, uh, they, ha- they, they keep ushering him. He <laughs> has to ascend. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he's like, <sighs> well, I have and, to do it. And but then it's interesting because yeah. what leads up to that vision, right? In the first movie, the visions that he gets, it's Chani that's leading him. Because he keeps having this vision of a woman leading him. Mm-hmm. And she'll turn her head and she'll he'll see it's Chani. In part two, who's leading him in the vision now? His mom. It's his mom, yeah. right? Like, so the vision has changed. It's altered. And yeah. Lady Jessica has taken control of his destiny. Yeah. And it foreshadows that Shawnee, her role is going to be diminished. And he Lady earned. Yeah. yeah. And it's very Freudian, the competing of like the mother versus like oh, the what, right? Yeah. And so the mother, and I think you, we had a conversation about that where there is kind of a weird Freudian relationship mm-hmm. between him and his mom. But- the mom is like, I'm going to go to the South. I'm going to like get all these converts, right? Mm-hmm. So that when you take this role of this identity, they'll already be, there they'll all be you. ready to be behind you. Yeah. Right. So it's interesting because she has this whole, I mean, she's, we find out she's pregnant. Mm-hmm. She takes the water of life, which name is already interesting itself. Yep. And it's interesting because the water of life comes from the, the, the sandworms. Yeah. So that, which is chaos that's where the source of life to sustain. But not adult like, ones, they're infant ones. So like, right. so it's still a purity. In they're, yes. So they're, they're infant because they died. Well, to. yeah, trying to get the, uh, yeah. Right. But it's not like they're like teenager. But you, <laughs> yeah, but that is an interesting thought. Like yeah. from the purity of a young sandworm. Yeah, and it's like blue. Yeah. And they have so, to drown it to yeah. get it to open its mouth. Yeah. Right. So it's there's crazy. something that has to die. It gives you life. But then both Lady Jessica and Paul undergo a death of sorts, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Lady Jessica's death 
when she wakes up, there's a sense of clarity that she has. She's also able to communicate with her unborn child, That's still- which is wild, right? But there's a clarity that she has about what needs to happen now. I think there's also the power grab of her wanting to be the great mother Mm -hmm. because there's already tension in the first film between her and the great mother. And so she sees the path, the potential that's laid out there. And Paul is key to that path, right? So Um, then is it really for Paul or for the betterment of people or is it for her gain? Yeah, I don't, That right? It's it's for the the chaos and every... It's all chaos. And every single character, it's... Shifting. Well, and that's why Paul doesn't want to drink the water of life because in a weird way, the water of life is going to tell him which story to live. Mm -hmm. It's going to give him clear. Because again, he's trying to hold all the stories together. He's learning the Fremen's ways. He's actually got a really good bond with them, especially Stilgar, right? He's earned Stilgar's trust. Yeah. There's a lot of humanity in those scenes of them just hanging out, you know, just having conversations and... You know, him and Chani just, you know, talking about water and all these different things. But he knows that the water of life is going to push him into a story. And it's going to push him into the the ruler archetype, right, of the Mahdi. Like, he will fully become that. He will become the magician, like the male Bene Gesserit, right? He already is the revolutionary, but he will take the voice from the outer world, right? Like, he will become those things in full. And his father, Chani, like, those archetypes are going to die once he takes the water of life. Because it's this, again, This there's so many emotions as I'm watching this. This He undergoes this death because, you know, that's what happens. He literally dies, and it's so interesting that Shawnee is the one that resurrects him. It's so interesting because there's some sort of love that awakens him, but what does it awaken him to, mm. right? It's such a, uh, it's so many things happening. Should just let him you, die. Yeah, <laughs> you, well, you have a resurrection, right? You have a resurrection, but your resurrection is almost like poisonous Mm -hmm. because that's what's happening with the hero's journey or this is the hero's journey turned toxic and the water of life is the elixir it's that which you or the boon right but it is a poison is it not just knowledge isn't that everyone's elixir it's in in a way yeah but it's like not not even just knowledge it's not it's control there's a sense of like I guess trying to control what you're seeing in a sense more than knowledge in the sense of but just knowledge. There's so much I, I feel with that because in the hero's journey, the boon and the elixir is meant to be, whether it's knowledge or physical, right? It's meant to save the people. And the weird thing about the water of life is does it actually save the Fremen or does it lead them on a path that is going to lead to their destruction or it's going to lead to the corruption of the soul, right? The fact that everything in the hero's journey Paul experiences in this film, but it's also turned to this place where it really becomes about him because the hero's journey is supposed to be where it becomes more and more about the other. It's transformation for the sake of the other, but this is tra- but is this transformation for the sake of the other or is yeah. it for the sake of himself? So many things, but I've yeah. done some talking. What you guys. <laughs> <laughs> he's also inheriting the will of control from the Bene Gesserit because he's taken on yeah. the memories of all the ones before him, just like his mom did, and he's getting influenced by that. Yeah. And I think that's the voices he's hearing all the time, right? Like it's all the Bene Gesserit that have been setting this path and want this to happen. Yeah. He's now falling into their story even yeah. more, and he's using it for himself. And I thought that the. He also discovers and inherits the Harkonnen way of thinking and way of doing it. Yeah, let's talk about the Harkonnens for a bit now. So, I saw this video of Villeneuve. So, he was talking about how the book shows how environments create a people in a mindset. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, he says, if you want to look at the Fremen and understand them, look at the desert. Mm -hmm. The Fremen are the output of the environment that they're in. They're they're not necessarily brutal, but they're severe, they're harsh, mm-hmm. and they're resourceful. But right. there's an honor and a sacredness of moisture of other things. Yeah. And they do not waste. Like Lady Jessica's crying and he's like, What are you doing? Yeah. Like, don't give don't, don't give your give, tears. Don't give your water away for yeah. anyone, even for the dead. 
Yeah. And if you want to look at the Harkonnen, look at their world. They have a black sun that takes away all color. Mm-hmm. It's completely black and white. And I think he said he did that scene in black and white and in ultraviolet or something like that. But it's to show that this is the type of people. They're brutal. All yeah. color is gone. It's a plastic artificial world, he yes. was saying. And which it's just indulgent too. That's that's what I got too when I watched because the movie changes. It, there, you almost get like a movie within a movie, right? Mm-hmm. Kind of like what Tarantino does mm-hmm. sometimes. So when you get to this like black and white, almost I'm not gonna say it. Almost said Snyder esque, but <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. You did say it. You technically yeah. said it a little bit, but you know, he but, regressed. But you do get. But you <laughs> do get. Big. But it is a black and white existence. Mm-hmm. It is a different movie we're in. And I think that's very intentional because the Harkonnens, again, like I said last episode, they are emotion. They are just like rage, lust. They are those deadly sins, right? The Atreides and the Fremen, they live in worlds of color, but they're different colors. Mm. Where Paul comes from, it's very dark. It's blue. Blue, but but Water. it's dark colors, mm. but there's, you know, blue is like a color of depth, Right. That, Ronnie wears that, a blue bandana. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't catch that. And, on her arm. Yeah. And then the the Fremen, right? They also live in a world of color, but it's very different. So their existences are a lot different than the Harkonnens. And then when you meet Fade Ratha, right? So Austin Butler's character, and you see that he is on an entirely different wavelength than everybody else, mm-hmm. even his own people. Yeah. Right? But- he is that wild, lust, hammy. He is those things, but he is also Paul in a way. Yeah, he can't. So he can be controlled. And it's not like he's this one dimensional figure. It's not shown so much. But when Margot, something or other, the Bene Gesserit that, mm-hmm. that in, seduced him, she's telling him yeah, what, Mar- what is, she's telling her what his levers are uh, yeah. humiliation. He's sexually vulnerable. Uh huh. He's a sociopath and he loves pain, but he's driven by honor and he wants to be heard. Is she pregnant by him? Yes. At the end? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Secure yeah, because the, the Bene, this okay. is when I think the Bene Gesserits have given up on Paul and they need a new ace in the hole. They need mm-hmm. a new figure that can be this Messiah, right? Yeah. And so it, it shows the desperation that they're willing to turn to him. I throne could fall to I, I yeah, I think that's a great way without the because the Bene Gesserit aren't gonna admit that they're in trouble, but I think that action shows mm-hmm. that everything they've been trying to do. Because again, the Messiah was supposed to come, was supposed to be, you know, the next generation after Paul, and mm-hmm. it was supposed to come through Lady Jessica, right? Yeah. This is why she was supposed to have a daughter, but obviously they don't trust her anymore. And so they have to go through the Harkonnens. They have to go to the black and white. They have to go mm-hmm. to this entirely cardinal realm to try to try to get their way back. And that's what happens is when we lose, when we feel like we're losing control, when we're desperate, we turn to the flesh. We turn to carnality. Mm-hmm. We turn to those things. And we and it's ironic because the Bene Gesserits are supposed to be about the transcendent, but they go to the flesh. Yeah. She asks, can he be redeemed? And she mm-hmm. says, he can be controlled. Yeah, yeah, that's all they care about at that point. Yeah. They don't care about redemption. Redemption, no, but can we get a rain on it? Yeah. Okay, then fine. And that's what religion can do, right? That's the that's the the toxic side of religion is when it appeals to the flesh and not the spirit. I, th- I think the two, uh, Chani and Stilgar really represent the two two reactions that can be given to religion. Yes. And I think I really like Stilgar's character. And he's funny too, but I can't remember what you were saying in the beginning about how stories can entrance us. Uh Uh-huh, like a spell, yeah. Yeah, he is, I think, the representation of that. Yes, yes, he is. You know, we're praying, we're praying. He's got the the hat on and he's completely into it. And even when Paul is like, you know, I don't believe in that. He says, I don't care if you don't believe. I believe. Yeah. And he's the one who's the first one to say, Lisan al Gaib. And he well, kind of puts that, I don't want to say on the people, but he's leading that. Yeah. Thing. And he's leading the belief in Paul. And he's even telling Paul, like, you can't speak here. Only leaders can take my life. Yeah. Like yeah, he is putting his life in. And then there's Chani who says, you know, religion is controlling people. You want to control someone, you give them a messiah and they'll yep. wait. Yes. And they won't go in and take action. 
So I and the Fremen, they weren't getting as many hits on the Harkonnen before Paul came. Yeah. But now they're kind of spurred more into action because someone came to lead them, but they could have led themselves. Yes, they but could. they were given something to wait for, so they did not take action until you know the Bene Gesserit that could give them something right. that they can control it didn't happen. But and even there's this one scene where he goes, You still don't trust me? Because she says, You can control them but not the people. Mm -hmm. And she kind of jabs him with that. And she has this fear of Paul trying to control her people. Right. She really, really loves her people and wants the Fremen to be free. Mm -hmm. But she is aware of the schemes of the Bene Gesserit of being controlled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what really hurts her is Paul stepping into that and taking control of her people and manipulating them. And that's where she's just completely angry and she's she's done with him and then of course the last straw is taking the emperor carino's daughter's right. hand yeah and we'll get that, to that in a bit we'll get to the whole final ending in a moment that just reminds me of what i kind of had a conversation with nick in the theater not a conversation but i kind of yeah. like had a side note I yeah like, yeah i remember that i was like i was like it's kind of in the beginning when paul's walking through the crowd and they're all shouting at him saying that you're not our messiah you're not our messiah right. pretty much like that mm -hmm. i was i turned to nick and i was like it's kind of kind of hard or something's kind of in me where it's like it's kind of one of those things of seeing like African Americans just shouting out at a, like a white man or like a white man coming in as being mm. their messiah. Mm -hmm. But as the movie went on, it showed like, no, this is not what that story is trying to tell. It's more like this is showing what someone can do in that position and turn a people yes. to their side in like yeah. a more evil way. It's like, oh yeah, that that's yeah. yeah so totally. Was, yeah. So that's pretty much. What, yeah. He who controls the narrative, right? Controls the um, future. Can, spice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's how the, the movie opens flow. is with yeah. that yeah. quote about he who controls the spice has the power, right? Yeah. And so I think that's that's interesting because Paul does not control the spice. He doesn't harvest the spice. The spice controls him. The spice gives him the vision, yeah. right? So it's ironic because the spice is controlling Paul. And then Paul is the one who's ultimately going to control the planet of the spice. So, and I think as Christians, there's a lot going on here for us to take away as well. We have a story as Christians that we're influenced by, right? The gospel. And that story of the life of Christ, it does have influence over us. It does give us meaning. But how many times do people in places of power and authority use that story to manipulate and control others? So this could include certain missionaries throughout history. This could include the, the Catholic church or just the church at large. Different denominations and sects of Christianity have been guilty of this. And even coming out of that, there's this idea that we try to be the, the saviors, like the white savior complex, like a film like Silence that goes into this idea of where maybe we have good intent, maybe we're devout believers of our faith, but we come in thinking that it's our job to save everyone from what we think they need to be saved from. And I think Dune is a caution and a warning towards the potential that we all have towards falling into that role. How trying to do something good or that seems good in our eyes can actually get perverted. And it can be hard sometimes to come to grips with the dark potential that lies underneath what it is we believe in. But that's one of the reasons why I love Dune so much is because it gives us space to confront that shadow, to confront the darkness that we are capable of. You can start off with pure intentions like Duncan in the first film trying to learn the Fremen ways or even Paul in the second film. But then that could turn into power and manipulation as you better understand a people you know how to control them and if you have something they all want or something that a way that they perceive of you then you can use that to your advantage but it's it's wild because i think another key aspect of control is the sandworm which i think is one of the best scenes in the film from mm -hmm. a filmmaking perspective right like what did you think of that nick in terms of just the filmmaking him learning to ride the sandworm no, it was cool. Right now, I just kind of feel like Chani's the avatar for the audience in the movie. Yes, mm -hmm. like, totally. Right now, I feel like the avatar for the listeners of this podcast. <laughs> I'm just like blown. I'm listening, and it's 
I'm blown away by what I'm hearing. Yeah. And like, you're talking at me like I'm, like, the audience. <laughs> That's what I feel like I am the avatar. I'm Johnny for this podcast right now. <laughs> well, it's interesting because he has to ride the sandworm. That's his final test, right? That's his final threshold he has to cross in order to truly be not just a Fremen, but a leader in the Fremen. Mm -hmm. You have to control the chaos. But this kind of solidified that for the Freeman too. Like he is, yes. he is our Well, because it was the big one, yeah. which that is that also is not in the book, that it was the big one. Okay. He actually got that from the David Lynch film, that that whole aspect of it. But, but he rides the sandworm. Now the sandworm is really that which has control of the desert. So he rides the being that controls the desert in a, in a sense. And, but the interesting thing is once Paul drinks the water of life that comes from that, which comes from within the sandworm, then he becomes the sandworm. He becomes the one that's going to control the desert and devour everything in his path. So he goes from riding the sandworm to becoming the sandworm. That's in the later books too. Yep. Right? <laughs> yeah. That's doing Messiah, right? <laughs> is that Messiah? Do Messiah, that's the next one, yeah. Let's get to kind of like the ending though now. So he drinks the water of life and he has that scene where I'm like, okay, Tim, any doubts about Timothy Shamalet's performance are erased here. Mm. The scene where they are questioning if he really is the Messiah after even go coming back the from the dead. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh my God. And and so he has that scene and what happens? What stood out to you guys you, there? You like it's it's how he controlled the entire room. You would think that he's even using his voice, but he's like that underlying voice where he controls people, yep. but he's not. It's he's just using his regular voice. Yeah, he's using his regular voice and just all the things that have built up to this point of what he's trying to be tried to deny this entire time, like of all the quote quote evidence to prove that he's the Messiah, but him using that now after he's you taken yeah. the worm mm -hmm. juice. <laughs> Yeah, the trunk juice. Well, I yeah, meant right. to I meant to finish this point, but he's being he's tapping into being a Harkonnen. Mm -hmm. like yeah, literally the scene after he says that because he learns the in the desert. vision that he's the grandson yeah. of right. the Baron. But the the right after he says we'll survive by being Harkonnen, it sprawls and it shows the desert, but it's the sand is black and the horizon is white, like like the homeworld. Yeah, yeah. It resembles the Harkonnen homeworld, and he's telling people what they see in their nightmares and stuff like that. And he's telling people about, you know, your grandmother lost her eye right. from a rock mm. that hit her when she was 12 or something like that. And he tells them what their homeworld used to be called, which was Dune. Yeah. You're right. So, and he just uses charisma. He mm -hmm. he forces, he like he's very well, kind of brutal and straightforward like the Harkonnen are. Right. So one thing you just made me think of, Jason, is that the vision that Paul has with the water of life, it's a clashing of his stories. And I didn't even think of mm -hmm. this because there's the black and white, the hearken inside of him. Mm -hmm. There's he sees the ocean like his own planet. Yeah. Right. But he sees it yeah. merging yeah, with, with, with the with, desert. Mm -hmm. So you literally see all the stories are they're all well, put together and he takes control. Right. In that moment. Like if anyone has any doubt, once mm -hmm. he starts prophesying basically to people, yeah. they're like, they worship everyone except Shawnee. Yep. Shawnee's the only one who's not converted Can at this see point. see through it. Even Gurney though, because Gurney comes back, right? Mm -hmm. It's interesting because Gurney at first is kind of like, oh, I see what you're doing here. Like you're kind of playing into this role. Yeah, good. You yeah. know, like you'd be the Duke like your father. But then I actually think Gurney kind of converts at no this, i right? think he's you, more like i'm down for the revenge yes, more, yeah I think. yeah oh yeah i'm down to for to kill all the other people Ernie was pushing him towards the role that he has yeah, yeah. End, i thought when yeah. he when he puts the signet ring on that's, that's when, when he, he stands, really gets yes. gurney gurney is it's he knows how to get end. get him on his side yeah that's good gurney misses his dad ring because yeah. last gurney misses alito when we were first he introduced changes. to him he's just like it kind of like no purpose, really. Just like mm -hmm. he's just around in the, de the desert playing a yeah, guitar. He's hanging with the smugglers. Which, by the way, yeah, that is one of the uh, that is one of the main re reasons why Josh Brolin got cast for that role. To play the guitar. Was because he could play that. It's not a guitar. It's A sitar? No, no, no. It's some weird... I can't remember the name of the instrument. But because he could play that instrument, that's the only... That's one of the main reasons why he got that uh, role. That's the... He's, but that's hilarious. Villeneuve does like Josh Brolin, too. Mm -hmm. But anyways, so then... He gets the emperor's attention, mm -hmm. and what do we think of Christopher Walken as the emperor? It, Florence yeah. Pugh as the daughter. It's just fair, yes, there's Ferris too many Bueller. positives. Let's skip the negatives. <laughs> <laughs> just, just skip over. Yeah, what's yeah. 
Yeah. No, we can we can go through the process. Walken was trying so hard not to sound like Walken. He was. Trying so I'll, I'll give him that. He is trying very I'm, hard. I'm the emperor of the universe. I am the emperor. <laughs> I just saw Max Shrek. Who do you, Max Shrek. That's what do you I think saw. of Muad'Dib? Like, I, I I he was built up for so much this emperor to just I was just like, oh it's oh it's Willem Dafoe. But I, but it, I actually or, I mean, excuse me, Christopher Walken. But I, I actually was William Dafoe. That'd be yeah, but I actually think Still not. I actually think this might have been intentional because I do like the fact that the emperor is just this frail old guy just that's not guy. really a threat. Like I do, his daughter is more. It seems like more in control of everything, more right? Than, than he is. Yeah, she's the one narrating the story, not yeah. him. Yeah. So I actually think that if that is what Villeneuve is going for, then it works. If it's not. Then it's a fit that it's might be one of the they could have got someone. The, they could have got someone but, way up, somebody but, else. Though. Someone I've never seen before. Yeah, it's yeah. just, it just kind of. Th- it's just like you see everyone. It's not like oh, that's Oscar Isaac, but it's like oh, that's that character. But when you see Christopher, when you see Christopher Walken, Walken, all you see is Walken. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but anyways, he gets the Emperor's attention. The Fremen have that final battle against the Harkonnen, right? Mm-hmm. Dave Batista gets basically killed pretty. Yeah. Easily, yeah. His you, his purpose is done. To like die. they his just purpose is to die. His bur- yeah. <laughs> Too many characters. Too many characters. They had to just get rid of him. They could have spent Gross. twenty more seconds on that. Yeah, scene. I think he the. I think that scene should have gotten a lick in. Well, yeah. he wasn't even built up to be any kind of force in this. Yeah, one. like he's no. running away scared at one point. Well, yeah. I think the Baron said he forfeited his purpose, right? And yeah. now he's putting his faith in his younger nephew. But yeah, but then there's that showdown. The last showdown. The last showdown. So Dune 1 ended with a knife fight. That was his initiation. This is a Fremen. Mm -hmm. It also ends now with a knife fight, but with his initiation to rule the universe. Yeah. So it just shows how far he's come by the end of this film, the parallel there, right? That that fight starts the Holy War. Yeah. Well, and I love that the music, which, by the way, we haven't said this yet, but the score, Hans Zimmer's Mm -hmm. score for both Dune movies. Yeah, he's always clapping. I like the second one better. The first one I didn't like that much. That that noise is personally (laughs) just like a little irritating. Yeah, but the second one I thought was better. Yeah, the the score is so good, right? I love when Zimmer, Villeneuve, and the the cinematographer that they that he gets, Greg Frazier, like those three together just create like my new favorite movies. Mm -hmm. Um, They're just incredible. But I love the choice to cut the music. Oh, there was yeah. no music in that final and, yeah. duel. It was just yep. like just hearing like the stillness of the room, like you were really there. Yeah, no theatrics to it I'll because get stabbed twice. Yeah, right. Well, this is that fight. This is where everything comes into like the climax, right? Because Paul and Fate are they are mirrors of each other. You know, Paul wants to save this people. Right. There's something good about him that's there. He accepts this fate to be the Messiah, even if millions are going to die. So there's like the spiritual transcendent purpose he has. Fade, again, as I said earlier, he's all the flesh. Yeah. You know, before he kills the Fremen in the arena, he says, I've seen and learned all and only pleasure remains. That statement sums up his character <laughs> right there. Right. He, despite the vast array of what he knows and sees, all he wants is the flesh. All he wants is pleasure. This is interestingly, right? Like they are cousins. Yeah. And, you know, Paul, like anybody, we all could go down that path that fate goes down. Paul could be like this crazy genocidal, like the way fate is. Yeah. But but there is some goodness of Paul that's still there. But nonetheless, they have this fight. And I think Paul's ability to control. The line in the first movie about the blade, what Gertie teaches him yeah. about the slow blade, that's how he wins the fight. Yeah. And so I'm like, ah, oh, I see what you did there. Like We he, see what you're and doing, And he movie. didn't turn his back because that's the other thing is he always would turn his back and people yep. would get mad at him for that. This time he does not turn his back. He, he stays, he looks forward yeah. with confidence, right? And the emperor puts his trust in this wild card basically and that's what leads to the Emperor's downfall. It, it was interesting because Fade had the Emperor's blade and uh-huh. Paul had Chani's blade. Yes. And it was with Chani's own blade that she gave him that 
he pushed her away at the end. <laughs> Paul did turn his back. Yeah. Yeah. To her, to well, her. he turned his back on her. Yes. Is and it? and it's even like I think the blade was on his back as as he had his back to Chani too. So I just thought like, you know, what is she thinking that he's using her knife to, to gain do this? Pa- yeah, yeah, to, to gain, to gain power, power over her people. Mm-hmm. That so when I think one of the best acting moments is moments in the whole film is when they the fight is over. And Paul takes control of this destiny, right? Once and for all. Yeah. And then says that he wants the emperor's daughter's hand. Yeah. I know. It crushes you, right? Because that's how he takes... Because, he's again, he's moving into that ruler archetype, and that's what you have to do yeah. to stay in power. Yeah. But And then he says to Chani, before all this happens, no matter what it happens... happens I, I will always love you. Yeah. And Lies. Chani, <laughs> No, I'm not but Chani that. looks at him. Chani looks at him, right? And it's just that stare that Zendaya gives. Mm-hmm. Paul's look is just as good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. And then Chani just, she leaves. She's no longer a part of the story. Yeah. Her movie ends with her out in the desert trying to ride a sandworm. She's trying to find meaning. She's trying to tame the chaos. But she has been cut out of the narrative completely. She is no longer Fremen. She is, she doesn't know who she is anymore. And that idea that Paul has found his story, but he's taken away her story. Mm -hmm. Like that's how this movie ends. Mm -hmm. It ends with the character we most identify with the window of the audience. It ends with us no longer connected with the narrative. Yeah. And I'm like, that is a brilliant ending. Yeah. That is a brilliant ending because we are not connected with this, right? By the end, we are not with Paul. We're not rooting for Paul. Yeah. And it ends with us out in the desert. Nick, yeah, what is you? I don't know how you're doing this day. <laughs> <laughs> that's dope. See, this is what I was feeling. This is why I was feeling so much. That's why he was. That's why he was crying when he was peeing. That's why bro. I was crying. When I, was peeing. <laughs> well, I, I saw. I think I sent it to you guys. Denis was intent mm. about using Chani as he said it was. She's my secret weapon because. <clears throat> and he he referenced the beginning when the book came out that people saw Paul as a hero and yeah. it's, mm. it was a cautionary tale and he, he wanted to honor the original intent of the author. Right. And so he used Chani to create a distance between us and Paul mm. and to make us feel exactly that. Yeah, that was that is the best change that he made from the book, in my That's opinion, good. is changing Chani's character. Because in the book, she just bows down and worships yep. him, and it's like, oh, he's won everyone over. He's the only but one standing. the audience yeah. is not won over, and if Chani is the stand-in for the audience, I love that, because we are not won over anymore at this point. I remember the whole movie... Uh, you saw me. I was tense. I yep. was just mortified the whole time because I didn't know it was going to happen. Yep. I thought mm-hmm. Paul was going to come and just die right there. Yeah. I thought he was going to get killed. And, but the whole time, I'm like, no, please don't make the decision. Oh, he made that decision. Oh, no, he's got to do this. Please. Oh, no, don't well, do that. Well, but just, I understand, though. It just goes yeah, to show. I felt like I'm just being dragged like a roller coaster. Well, it just goes to show if you this. don't die to yourself, then all that's left is the self. Yeah. Like, even if you try to transcend, it becomes the worship of the self, right? And again, 1960s counterculture, that's what was happening for a lot of things. That This is what the struggle was. Even now. And even now, we're in this now. Mm -hmm, This is incredibly relevant. But the last thing I'll say about this part of the movie here is that when you get to that last line, Paul's last line is like, let's lead them them to to paradise, paradise, right? which is how he's going to dress up war as a righteous thing. Mm. And so the prophetic words of the beginning of part one, who will be our oppressors, that is. And this, this is my last like big nugget, big epiphany here. This is a story about how the oppressed become the oppressors. Mm. And the Fremen, like, Paul, like this whole journey, everything that's happening, it's ironic because the Fremen are liberated and they are no longer the oppressed, Yeah, but they are the oppressors. And therefore as the oppressors, they are oppressed by darkness Mm -hmm. and evil. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. This movie makes me feel a lot of things. 
Any final thoughts about Dune 2? Let's go around the table. Like, I feel like my story got taken from me this podcast. <laughs> what do you mean? I'm Why? Jo- I'm joking. Because if I'm Chani in this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> this my, podcast my, my, I'm, on, I'm on the desert right now trying to ride a sandwich. <laughs> Paul, Paul says, she, she'll come to understand. I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. Nick will come to understand. Understand. That was so good. Oh, my gosh. I have to re-listen to this. <laughs> I didn't rewatch the movie. Yeah. yeah. I need to rewatch the movie, too. But what struck me most was the the archetype that Paul was playing, all these archetypes. And if I didn't read that book that you talked about, one of the podcasts before, it wouldn't have hit as hard. Right. So the idea of him moving into these archetypes and then some of the archetypes falling away as you're playing all these roles. So to to see the movie through that lens was super helpful. Yeah. I'm like really excited about the next one. Like looking into like the history of all like the Dunes, um, mm-hmm. lore anyways it's like okay i'm excited to see where the direction is the director's going to take because again he is changing things in this dune yeah so it's it still may go beat by beat but there's still going to be th- twists and turns within it so i'm excited to see it yeah this yeah. was this was i feel like this is what people that watch star wars for the first time were experiencing yes like this is this yeah. is our modern type of star wars i it's agree really, it's really dope i'm glad to be yeah. Like experiencing good movies again. Who said movies aren't good in right? 2024? Look at me. There's some good ones. I, I, this movie really grips me. I, I feel like him and Anakin going down a path was similar. That was, it's kind of like what George Lucas was trying to do in trying the Trying to, yeah. right? trying to. If he had that dialogue a little better. You yeah. Know? <laughs> but if, man, Anakin would hate this place. Sand everywhere. <laughs> 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 that is awesome. But Anakin would lose to Paul simply because the sand would just. But anyways, no, I really, really like this movie a lot, and I like that it's being received really well. Yeah, and you know, I'm hoping that it leads to a lot of more artistic movies being accepted and appreciated, and that yeah. we start to go to that route and art over business is yeah in the future. I hope so. Well, this is what happens when you let a filmmaker actually do their thing, right? Yeah. Let them have full control of it. And, but this is the key too, we've talked about this a lot, Jason, is getting somebody who actually loves the material they're yes. making. Like he loves Dune. He Dude, loves this childhood. story, right? But he also is a great filmmaker and knows how to tell the story in a way that is going to work best for the medium of film. And that's the biggest challenge that there's there's been TV shows of Dune, there's been movie of Dune, right? But nothing has done it because you have to have both of those skills there. And he does. One day on this podcast, we will do Blade Runner 2049, which is yeah. in my favorite movies of all time. But between that and Arrival and these two Dune films, mm-hmm. I think it has cemented for me personally that Denis Villeneuve is my favorite filmmaker right now that is making movies. And I know he's got a lot of projects lined up besides the next Dune, but these movies, they are really special. They make me feel a lot because they challenge me mm-hmm. as a storyteller. They challenge me as someone who loves stories, mm-hmm. who's, you have to be willing to see the shadow, the dark side. Uh, you have to be able to see that in everything you do, not just a storyteller, but even as a Christian, right? Yeah. Being as someone who is religious, who is spiritual, you have to confront the dark side of your faith. You have to confront the dark side of, you know, what Christianity is and has been capable of and has done. And I think Dune literally like brings all the shadow selves of me out. And it is incredibly overwhelming to stare at your shadow for five plus hours. <laughs> it felt like that. I got, I remember turning, I was like, oh, this is like bat, the Batman long, but I could sit through this one again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Plus I look like the main character. So <laughs> it's just, that's the icing on the cake. But if you want to learn more about the power of storytelling, how to harness it for good, that's the key here. Yeah. Then visit allthingsnarrative.com, our coaching, our workshops. Um, if you sign up for our mailing list, you'll get a free bonus episode. That's five tips to improve your storytelling. So all you have to do is visit this link in our show notes. And again, take control of the narrative, but don't let the narrative control you, yeah. right? And so if you learn about storytelling, if you read great books like The Storytelling Animal, you can have a better understanding of the power of storytelling and how to use it responsibly in your life. And that's where we're going to end for Dune Part 2. So thank you guys again. And until next time, take care. 
Thank you for listening to the Live a Meaningful Story podcast produced by All Things Narrative. If you'd like to learn more about our coaching, workshops, events, please check out allthingsnarrative.com. You can also follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at All Things Narrative. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and tune in next time as we continue exploring the stories we love and the stories we live. Take care.